Okay, well, we're rolling. (laughs) Okay, we're starting. Are we ready? Yeah, this is part of the idea. I want to (laughs) know if you can tell me about a time in middle school when you lied to your family. When I lied to my family? In middle school. I I remember uh, my mom being amongst the most upset she's ever been when I got the first Eminem CD, you know, and I, and I don't, Mm. I don't believe I lied. I don't think so. I mean, I got it and then she knew that I had it and I handed it. I just remember handing it to her Mm. and, um, as an adult and, you know, a parent now, like looking back on that time, I'm like, wow, that was, that was a really hard, I was, I think she was in one of the lowest periods of her life. And that was like a, that was like just touching the nerve, you know, mm. it was like, it, like it's, 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 it's hard to raise kids. And, mm. and when you feel like there's something that's going to, if there's something that you think is, is like deleterious to your, to your child's well being and to their sense of self, uh, you know, their, their mental health, like, mm-hmm. It just feel and and then of course capitalism standing there just all big and tall and strong and just mm. you can't do anything about it you can't you can't it's so hard to know what to do in the face of that and so I remember handing her the CD. Did I like lie? I probably I might have she might ask me like how I got it and maybe mm. I lied. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, this is ending up being way more serious than I thought. Okay, wait, so I now, sorry. please tell your story. Yeah, I'm not going to tell. I'll save my. I'll save my adult. Uh, I didn't lie, but I would have lied if I if there was no way that I wouldn't get caught. Um, but. My sister and I were not allowed to watch 90210, the original 90210, but we obsessed with it, like really wanted to. And my parents had a meeting every, I don't remember what night of the week, let's say Monday, but whatever it was, they had a meeting the night that 90210 was on, so we would watch it. (laughs) But we'd like flip to like Full House or some other like, you know, safe show, and we would monitor. You could see when the car was coming in, so we'd like stand guard and monitor. And if we would see that the car was coming in, we'd like switch to the other show. So I feel like that's like a long, that was like a long-term lie, pretending not to watch Mm -hmm. the show that we were that we were uh, forbidden expressly from watching. Did you ever get caught? I think that we must have, and I think I probably lied. I think at <laughs> one point my mom must have, must have walked in the room when we were watching, and I don't remember this, but I feel like it's consistent. It, tra- it tracks and must have been like, oh, I, don't, I, I just slipped to it by accident. I don't watch that show. <laughs> Meanwhile, I knew, like, everything that was happening on 90210. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know about you two delinquents, but I've never <laughs> lied to my family. I was a perfect child. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Why'd you ask no, then? No, but I I do consider us here at Podcrush somewhat of a family. And to me, oh, that includes, is that where this has been headed the whole time? David. <laughs> and I have who, who I want to step in for a moment. Wait, so Sophie, you've never to lied com- to your parents? No, I have. I no, know. just but David. But this is a more this is a this is the lie I want to I want to come clean David. on. David, alrighty. <laughs> to my Podcrush family, it's time I finally tell you that I'm pregnant. <gasps> Congratulations. <laughs> Yay. What? <laughs> Thank you. What? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's been several weeks. So you've been, been lying. lying to us. By omission. You've been lying to us. <laughs> you know, I Is thought you were I, pregnant like a month ago and you mentioned having your period. So I was like, I guess not. There was yeah. like something that happened a month ago. Lie. I was like, Sophie's pregnant. That was the lie, yeah. Okay, I that knew was the you actual were, straight out I lie. knew you were pregnant. I knew it. <laughs> I wasn't it. fasting and I, I knew you were I pregnant. Had to come yeah. up with a reason. <laughs> so funny. I knew okay, it. I was going to yeah. text you, are you pregnant? And then I was like, no, like she'll, sh- she'll share it in her own time. And then that day you mentioned you had your period. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's funny. good. I oh, threw congratulations. Off the scent. Congratulations. Thank that's so wonderful. Thank you. Just can't get over being lied to. No, this is obviously. I've ever told. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I actually thought? I was like, well, this has been a whole elaborate ploy to tell us that she's pregnant. This, this isn't banter. <laughs> you this did? We, we, like a restart. Yeah. He wants to restart the banter. <laughs> yeah, like, well, what are we, we've just wasted seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Unusable. Well, about 12 years from now, you know, you're going to have a little middle schooler on your hands. <laughs> That's right. Hmm. Hopefully they don't lie to me. They will. Today's guest, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to segue other than taking one joy to another. We actually did have uh, a a really lovely, I don't want to say unexpected, but it was just a really lovely time with Jamila. Mm-hmm. Our guest, Jamila Jamil, is an actress, a writer, and an activist who's made a name for herself not just in her creative work but also through her advocacy work around body neutrality, mental health, 
and a number of other issues. So she first rose to fame as a presenter on British television, and then she later became known for, for I think, what you're going to know her for. Uh, in The Good Place, she played Tahani Al-Jamil. So Jamila also has two podcasts. It sounds like she might have more coming out, but she's, but she's got two, Bad Dates and um, I Weigh. I Weigh has become a movement in its own right, challenging social norms and encouraging conversations around mental health and identity. And actually, I should say, Jamila is, is such a, a, a joyful conversationalist. We really went there. This is a very funny, really lovely episode. That said, um, we should offer a bit of a trigger warning. We do touch on suicide, abuse, eating disorders. And for those of you who listen with your kids, I know some of you are out there. You got your own middle schoolers and your teenagers. Uh, some of the conversation is a bit bit more graphic than than typical, but it's you know even, it's probably nothing they haven't heard. Just beware. Uh, we did love having Jamila on. I don't think you're gonna want to miss this, so please stick around. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Sophie, and I'm Nava. And I think we would have been your middle school besties. And we'll do spells under the bleachers. <laughs> I think that's too much. This is good content. <laughs> so let's mm-hmm. start in London. I mean, you're are you born and raised in London? I was born in London, and then I lived a little bit in Pakistan. I lived a little bit in Spain, and then I ended up back in London until I was 28 years old. We moved back and forth quite a lot between all three places, basically because we were very poor, and we uh, moved wherever the pound was strongest. Mm. So mm. Uh, wherever we could get the most bang for our buck, we would we would go to. Like I moved a lot as a child. I think we. I think I moved 13 different times to different homes. Wow. Um, a wow. lot of times we would be removed by bailiffs, uh, who are the people that come. I don't know if you have the same term here, but they're people it's who come if you're in so if you're in debt, they come and they just yeah. take your stuff. And so mm-hmm. that became like a very normal part of my childhood. Uh, that has led to some slight money trauma now <laughs> where I can't stop working because mm. I'm terrified that's ever going to happen to me again. But it was a very kind of... Um, disjointed childhood that probably set me up for a career in which I'm rarely in the same place for longer than about three months. I feel you there. There, We definitely have some similarities. I'd had a very, very traumatic childhood. Uh, There's a lot of abuse in my childhood and I experienced a lot of uh, other people being abused. I was also raised by a lot of very, very severely, severely, severely mentally ill people and I was kind Mm. of responsible for them from around the age of about nine years old. So... Mm. I, by the age of 11, I totally kind of disconnected and left my body uh, Mm. in a way that I'm not sure I've ever returned fully back. Um, And I I knew that academia was like the most important thing in my lineage because we're South Asian as fuck. And Mm -hmm. uh, if you know any other South Asians, the majority of us have been pressured to do very well at school. And there was a safety in the control I had over over academia and the fact that I could get good grades and I had a scholarship. And so I buried my head in my book so much that I I feel as though I'd kind of, I became quite numb and, and just like a disconnected computer, really. Wow. Oh. Jamila, when you say that at nine you were responsible, do you mind sharing a little bit what that looked like? Like how could you as a nine-year-old sort of take, take that on? Hmm. I think just, yeah, I think making food, uh, Mm. making sure people were showering, making sure people took medication if they were willing to take medication, Mm. um, stopping people from killing themselves, calling the hospital or the doctors if I thought they were going to. So it was just, it was a lot to take on as a very Mm. small kid. But, Mm. you know, you're so amazingly resilient as a child that you don't know that that's not normal. You don't know that other people's families aren't like that. And you just, if if you're told that's your job, you think that that's your job. And so it didn't feel especially hard for me. I just felt sorry for everyone else. But that has led to like a pattern of me uh, always putting other people's needs entirely before my own that Mm. I'm trying to now undo as an 85 year old woman <laughs> it, I mean you've lived a lot of life yeah. yeah 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 and so that's that's what it meant it meant very literal care and then I became an official carer in my teens where I was being sort of paid by the state to look after people um and so it was just it was just it was very intense I think it's a big part of why I work in advocacy now is that I feel so strongly for other people's needs, probably because I was set up that way yeah. as as a child. And so it very much so resonates with me still. Um, mm. But, you know, 
What an upbeat way to start the podcast, guys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there's, a, there's another guest we had who, uh, who likes to start her interviews with, uh, with what is it? The, how's your soul? How, how, how's your and are soul? you dealing and with our... your childhood trauma? Yeah, yes. So, that's, oh, yeah. so yeah. I mean, that's yeah, we're where we're going. That's, <laughs> yeah. you know. And actually, I love what you said about dissociation because it, it's an important step in everyone's life to realize when and why they become mm-hmm. dissociative and to what degree. I honestly like that's a mm-hmm. that's a that's a huge huge thing. And so I guess like, w- w- when did you start to realize and be able to look back, or was it at the time that you knew like you, you're basically saying you're out of your body? You know, I uh. We won't go too deep into it because it'll really ruin everyone's day. Um, but I, um, I was badly abused as a child. And uh, I remember the exact moment I feel like I made the conscious choice at six years old to leave mm. my body so that it wasn't happening to my body. And I feel like that was the exact moment. And then I don't really remember how I felt after that, I think, because I didn't feel anything after that. And... I didn't really understand how much I haven't been in my body again until I just didn't check in with myself about that until maybe a few years mm-hmm. ago. And so I, I, I just sort of, it was a, it was a conscious choice of I, I tapped out a feeling anything and then it wasn't really happening to me. And so it felt like my life, like I was looking at it from the ceiling. I was watching someone else live this life and I just knew I had to get her to a place of academia or success where I could get the fuck out of there. And I I did. Did you feel like there were any adults in your life that were like a safe space for you or that could be role models for you that you clung to? No. No, no. So I became obsessed with Hollywood mm. um, actors and uh, like it's celebrities and that's uh, like, like, like totally obsessed with, with movies and film and I feel like I had to do all of my life learning about being quote unquote normal from film and television. So I watched I, I, every waking minute that I wasn't studying, I was I was watching film and TV. And I think that's why when I when it came time to do the Good Place audition, I'd never acted before, but I'd been subconsciously studying mm-hmm. television and film my whole life it, more obsessively than anyone. I knew it was like my hyper focus. Mm-hmm. So so those, you know, like the cast of friends, you know, were yeah. my parents Meryl (laughs) Meryl was my parent uh that's where I had to do a lot of my learning and and I don't any longer hold that again I used to look at it as a moral failing when I was you know younger and now that I'm 85 uh I have started to look upon those people I was raised with with so much more empathy and realize that god they really couldn't help it like that wasn't free will obviously abuse is never okay but they were dealing with the kind of demons that I thankfully can't even understand Mm -hmm. and I didn't inherit those same demons and I'm so grateful and I can't imagine what it's like to be responsible for a child uh, or be in the house of a child when you are going through such like horrific psychosis Mm. so I I've calmed down a lot about that but um took me a minute yeah of course (laughs) So you, who were some of these, uh, we can get specific, some of these some of these role models you did have, like these obsessions, these what, the relationships you had with, uh, with, with, you know, whatever figure it was. I think Whoopi was a big one for me. It was, it was uh. mostly comedians. Uh, comedy was just such, uh, it was so able to like elevate me out of wherever I was. And it, you know, it was the dopamine rush of laughter. And I think I just looked upon these people as, magicians in the way that they could turn yeah. my the little feeling I did have around and they could just transport me and so I think Whoopi Goldberg, Hugh Grant, uh, eventually Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant with The Office and Extras I, I became really really I mean Ted Danson a huge mm. part of it in Cheers yeah. so it was so fucking weird to find myself like come full circle where I'm standing opposite him and we're acting in a scene together and mm. this is a man who's been such a huge figure in my you know my escape as a kid it just felt so surreal um being there it and a unique kind intense. of um yeah, I mean the unique kind of comic figure he's become since Cheers as well. It's mm-hmm. different. I mean, as a the, the Ted Dancer we know now. Yeah, I he's think, a goofball. I mean, he's a he's yeah. a very different Ted Dancer from Cheers, <laughs> yeah, right? In yeah, a, in yeah. the best way, like yeah. in yeah. the best, almost most unpredictable way. 
Well, I also That's think aging cool. allowed him to like move away from the sex symbol thing yeah. that was quite restrictive to men and women. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can relate to that at all, Ken, but <laughs> no. Um, no, but no, maybe no. one day, maybe one day. But it's it's clinging to it, my youth and yeah. my perfect skin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 constrictive, and I think that once he he went past the age of of necessarily being like America's sex symbol, he had the freedom to let his freak flag fly, and it's an unreal thing to witness in person <laughs> that's amazing we could have a whole podcast about ted dancing i we i'm should. a weird i'm i'm let's a, have I'm a, a spin-off a, yeah all, all the four yes. of us will start a new <laughs> podcast you're not hosting in a podcast yeah. jamila yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> jamila i have a question in terms mm -hmm. of when your like study of performance art shifted into you actually being a performer. I don't know if it started with music or sort of at what age did you know that you had that like artistic power within you? I was so stereotypical. I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I had no interest in this industry. Um, and I was an English teacher uh, when I was first scouted by, well, I wasn't even scouted. That's, uh, I, I was sort of just told about an audition by this producer who said I should go for it because mm. he thought that I would be good on TV because he thought I was funny. And, uh, and I said, no, I would never want to be on television. Uh, you know, that's not for me. It's not, it's not anything I'd be interested in. And he said it was a thousand pounds a day. And I was like, excuse me, what? <laughs> You're like, I could be interested. <laughs> I had no idea that's the kind of money that people were making. And that's almost what I was making in a month as a yeah. teacher. Yeah. So, you know, given my youthful money trauma, I uh, went straight to that audition, didn't really have any expectations. I thought I'd probably get a free sandwich out of it. <laughs> and um, unbelievably, having no experience whatsoever, uh, got the biggest hosting job in youth television in like for teens in the history of the UK. So it was it was so intense. I was replacing this this beautiful um, model and presenter called Alexa Chung. And oh, I, know I was oh, yeah. I was I, I was a Alexa. teacher. I was a teacher Monday to Friday and then on the weekends I was live wow. on one of the biggest shows on television. And that was just my it just happened overnight and I became famous within about two months. Wow. And in the UK it's very easy to become famous because it's the the UK is the size of a very small asshole. <laughs> like a cat's <laughs> anus. Uh, and uh, my life changed irrevocably, uh. but completely without plan. So I never knew. Yeah. I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, please help me. <laughs> Wait, Jamila, I'm so curious. I was a, Sophie and I were both former teachers. Yeah. I was a former English teacher. Oh, nice. And I'm just trying to imagine if, like, one day I was their English teacher and then a few weeks later I'm super famous. Like, how did they react to you yeah. in that That's transition That's the experience period? you're having right now on this podcast. Now, I did have a student, a former student, be like, you shut up on my For You TikTok page. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I would hate it if one of my teachers <laughs> shut up on my uh, For You page. They've... They found it very surreal, very exciting. And then boundaries started getting crossed and mm. like suddenly they started seeing me in a new light and one of my male students um, bought me lingerie and I was like, I think <laughs> oh this isn't God. working <laughs> anymore. Because he was seeing me dressed differently on TV and just saw me in a whole oh new wanking God. light. Um, and <laughs> oh so I, so I, uh, I, I started to distance myself. But I kept that job for eight months into being like a famous television presenter. Wow. I was showing up to school at 8 a.m. Monday to Friday every single uh, week because I was so sure that this was a mistake. I was like, oh, <laughs> no. God, they've taken a chance. I did well on the day, and they'll work out that I have no talent or charisma um, and fire me. So uh, because I was so terrified of not having money, I um, yeah, I, I stayed. It was a very odd time for everyone involved. <laughs> and I think eventually it became, like, stressful for the school for me to be there because we were starting to develop, like, lines of kids outside, <laughs> outside wow. the school wow. uh, coming to find me. So, yeah. Uh, wow. Russell Brand also taught at that school, so I think that they do. What? Um, oh my god! It's like yeah. a theater for celebrities. <laughs> they, it's just like uh, just for lunatics. Listen, I think. you got to start teaching here, guys. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, I know. Yeah, it, all uh, our UK yeah. listeners want to know the name of this school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Callan Callan School. Wow! wow. Amazing. <laughs> that school, I was teaching English as foreign language, which is an extraordinarily. Um, humbling experience because a the people that you're teaching have been working since four o'clock in the morning mm. and then they're coming to you at midday or at 5 p.m to to learn a language from scratch they don't speak a word of english when they come to you and so you have to wow. teach them everything via only the art of mime um <laughs> which is <laughs> also in and of itself your acting <laughs> practice yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i've spoken before about like the moment that i um i i realized that this was probably not sustainable for my um 
sense of self was I was sitting in front of a group of 17 Polish nuns. And <laughs> I was having to explain to them via the art of mime why you can't pronounce sitting as shitting. Uh. And so I'm squatting, my, my, my fist is pretending to be the poo uh. and it's hitting the ground. And I was like, I can't do this forever, I think. I think, I it's think just interesting to me that you took a fist to and you <laughs> you, you slammed the fist on the ground <laughs> mm-hmm. like you actually went to the full for the full drop. Yeah, I'm just imagining you have to. what You're I would have to do. You're making a big point, you know, and uh, you really followed through. Mm, so I'm you, commending yeah. you from one yeah, performer you. to another. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, all these different things made an actor or made a performer out of me. They took yeah. like that. Really? That yeah. took all the shame out of me. Mm. Uh, I could do anything after I've taught a Polish nun. <laughs> to not say shit <laughs> via the art of mime. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of, you know, I was I was bred for this accidentally. Actually, you know, everything feels my like a step school. backward now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's your peak. Jamila, we have a couple of standard questions. They feel silly to ask you now, but just given everything you've shared, but we ask every guest three questions about their middle school experience, so if you're game. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first question is an embarrassing story from when you were that age, if you, particularly at school if you have one. I um I was very badly bullied at primary and secondary school because mm-hmm. I was extremely weird. Uh, and given my childhood circumstances, I think that's fair. But You're kids coping. don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I used to stare a lot. Um, I was a st- I was a starey, strange child uh, mm. in everyone else's defense. Um, and I was socially inept. And I used to I have Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is a, a collagen. Uh, a lot, well, you don't have enough collagen, so it means that you, I, I can be very hypermobile and I get sick a lot and I fall over a lot and I would break my bones all the time. And so uh, I was on crutches and no one ever used to speak to me. And then the most popular two girls in the school were throwing a uh, bat mitzvah together. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in. And they invited me and it had my name on it. So I knew it wasn't a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this is my moment. I'm going to the big, the big dance. Um, And so I, like my mum took me out and we got an outfit. It was fucking hideous. It was pleather (laughs) flares, snake skin pleather flares. As if I'm a sex offender, you know, from (laughs) the 70s. (laughs) (laughs) But then with like a red crochet, Mm. crop top and mm. I was like you know I was a chubby kid so like <laughs> oh. it's like nothing fits right nothing's the right mm. size and and I had uh, these big big braces and then she put my hair in like 30 braids and I was like I realized then I think she was cop blocking me and that's fine <laughs> that's that's actually how children <laughs> should be dressed at that age to make sure that they yeah. don't get preggers you know at the school <laughs> dance but um I turn up I'm in crutches at the time because I've fallen down the stairs or something and broken my leg and uh I'm I, I turn up, I'm very, very nervous. I haven't really been to a dance before. And the the two popular girls come out and they greet me personally. They're like, oh my God, Jamila, we're so excited to see you. And I'm like, of course you are because I'm your <laughs> new best friend. And they're like, come and dance with us. And I was like, oh, I can't, I'm on crutches. And they were like, no, you can, you can. You look amazing. Red flag. Yeah. Red fucking flag. They told me I looked amazing. No, I can't. I don't uh, think I can bear to hear the rest I know, of the story. I know, I know. So they like, they're like, come into the dance floor. So I'm coming on and I'm like hobbling in, hobbling in. No one else is on crutches. Um, and then they bring me into the middle of the dance floor and everyone's dancing around me and it's going so well and everyone's being so welcoming. And then suddenly one of the girls takes away my crutches. No, no, uh. no. And I obviously fall back to the ground no. and now I'm just lying in the middle of the <gasps> fucking dance floor and everyone's laughing at me and pointing and Gen Z would have never done this to me by the no, way no, Gen Z wouldn't. would have helped me up yeah. it's only these millennial cunts who did that to us like these kids are amazing they would have helped me oh, up and then started true. to fucking go fund me yeah. uh, but, <laughs> but, but I was born in the day where you know you terrorize someone and you thought it made them stronger um so eventually someone charitably went to get the parents and like six parents had to come to get me up and then they took oh. me outside and I sat on a stoop until my mum came to pick me up so that was embarrassing for me, technically. Yeah. But really but for them. Yeah. yeah. Fuck all of them. They all live basic lives now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do want to speak up it. for Gen Z. <laughs> I want to speak up for Gen Z here. They're not, they're, they're, they're not a monolith, guys. Yes, they're not I a monolith. Know. There's still plenty of terrible <laughs> kids I know, I out know. There. But, true, but at true. least they understand what trauma is. At least they have a firmer understanding. I feel, a, like, there, I feel a, like they're much more informed. No, yeah. it's true. Also, in the 90s, we were, like, fed all these, like, mean girl movies. 
where there was like the really hot mean girl and then the girl trying to simulate. And I feel like the new set of movies for Gen Z is like they don't really play on that. So you're just being informed no. differently. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's constantly changing, but I was definitely not the hot mean girl. Uh, I was, <laughs> Which is hard to believe know, looking at you now because yeah. you're stunning. Yeah. Uh, that's extremely kind, but I, um, you know, I just didn't, I, I, I didn't look the way that you were supposed to look in the nineties and it, it was heroin chic was in and, and white was in and South Asian looks were yeah. not in and we were not on the covers of any magazines. We were not starring in any movies like our look. It was a very, very racist time in Britain. So it's like, it was, I desperately aspired to whiteness when I was younger, mm. like desperately clung to like being like, God, I hope they think I'm Spanish. Um, which <laughs> is so sad because I come from such a beautiful culture. Um, and and I was so tall, you know, like I was five, ten and a half by the time I was like 12 or 13. Like I was so much bigger than the boys. Um, so, so socially odd. Uh, so it just like I was so bullyable. And um, and and so therefore it happened. And and did it make me stronger? Sure. <laughs> but would I, could I stand to be a bit less strong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that assessment. The other two classic questions that we ask about middle yeah. school, and then we'll pivot to your amazing career, um, <laughs> is can you tell us about your first love and your first heartbreak? Oh, uh, okay. So I didn't kiss anyone until I was 21, um, which is fairly consistent with everything else. I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've still only kissed six people. I keep trying to count Manny Jacinto in The Good Place, but he had to kiss me on camera and it was written into a script. So he's told me I can't count yeah. that one he's reached um, out to you personally he's like he's, he's had his lawyer contact me and ask me to stop saying it um <laughs> but um I uh so I was 21 when I had my first like love but my first heartbreak came before I was able to fall in love you know because you you fall in love whether it it's does. requited or not yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're younger and I think I was so in love with the boy that worked at my local video store um, that I, and I thought I was so cool with it. You know, I used to go in several times a day to rent videos in, within times where I couldn't have watched the film because I was there an hour ago. And I thought he was cool and he was totally not wise to it. You know, and I was just there casually and I would hang out for such a long time that it makes me want to jump off my balcony now thinking about it. And he was 18 and I was like 14. So I had no right to be bothering him. It's not legal, you know, it just puts him in a really weird position. And he was so kind to me and would tolerate the fact that I was endless there I would walk back and forth I would find reasons to go to the store that uh like my it was like my house was on one side then the video store then the supermarket and I would be I was I fucking kept that supermarket in business <laughs> uh just going back and forth a hundred times a day no one knew what the fuck was going on or how much I must be eating yeah. um but just to be able to see if he was there so I feel like he was like one of the first big like human loves of my life uh, yeah. to the point where I started working at the video shop even after he left in case he came Aww. back which is so <laughs> wow <fun. laughs> so many steps so many there for years. Jump conclusions. yeah <laughs> Wow. <laughs> he never came back. I was going to so ask. Was there, was, was, was there, <laughs> like, I can appreciate that it was just a long, slow, dull ache that is the heartbreak, but, like, was there yeah. a moment where he either had to address the elephant in the room I, or did you he know, never... No, I saw him with a girl. I saw him with a girl, and okay. I was um, so crushed. Uh, uh, I, I was so crushed that um, I feel like I, I played nintendo like 16 hours a day for mm. the entire summer holiday and lost like 30 pounds in heartbreak just so that's how you like, do it that was it that was yeah that's it's some people do a zempic um <laughs> some people do the, the mario and luigi diet um <laughs> but it was yeah it was a it was a, I, I, and mm. i thought it was the great breakup and all mm. the songs that i'd heard were about that and about me and all the movies and i was like that was my one shot for love yeah. um and so that was like my first memorable i lost to my mind break up over someone I'd never even kissed mm -hmm. uh, and then my first love was um, all my friends were getting really deeply concerned that I'd gotten to 21 without kissing anyone and so I got like 20 separate copies of the 40 year old virgin given to me <laughs> by friends um, oh, and <laughs> one of my friends charitably kissed me uh, after I turned 21 and then I really liked it, so I just kept <laughs> kissing him for like two and a half years, and he was my first love, and he Aww. was great. 
did it really start as a charity? Was he like, okay, Jamila, you haven't had your first kiss. I'm going to do it. Kind of, yeah. Wow. He was just like, we were sitting on a bench and he was like, we're going to do this now because <laughs> otherwise you're never going to do it. <laughs> and <laughs> kissed me and uh, it was the best kiss ever because I was an adult and he was an adult mm -hmm. and he was like eight years older than me. So he really knew how to kiss and uh, it was bloody brilliant. Couldn't get enough. <laughs> Became a kissing maniac. <laughs> Two and a half years later. <laughs> wow. I love that. You now have you now have a like a like a podcast series where you're you're addressing kind of what what you know what's the broadest way you could talk about bad dates? You're talking about like like dating culture. You know? We're talking about the silliest like parts of dating yes. culture, like the most yes. vulnerable extremes we will go to in pursuit of love or sex. Mm. Okay, Fingering, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the clarification. I just want to take it. I mean, fingering is making sure. a big comeback, and I just like I feel like we need more fingering representation. But wait you know, a second. Wait a second. First of all, what do you know? You've kissed six people. I just want to say I've not. I've I've, not. I, I I I I have my ear to the streets, kids. To the, okay, to and the, I'm to telling the, you, ear, fingering's yeah, on its way back. Is your yeah. finger on the pulse, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it never left. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, no, no, no. So I don't. I actually don't want to. I I. It was a joke, don't but, want to but I don't want to shame you at all for for the for the the number that you've said. I actually, you know, I, I'm interested in how a person in your position mm -hmm. ha has has said publicly, spoken publicly about, you know, having had a certain kind of romantic and sexual posture, which I think is, uh, you know, to me it's refreshing. I think there's a lot of posturing, um, with with a lot of people in our position where you're sort of, I mean, I know that I grew up feeling the pressure to, to, yeah. to constantly engage and relationships were the place where men go to die, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and there's, there's just, there's just something I think really nice about, about what you're saying. So, do, you know, and I've heard some of the way that you've shared it in different ways. And of course, you know, comedy is the best garment to don for any, thing right but i i just feel like get to the fucking point what do you mean i don't understand <laughs> sometimes i love you <laughs> no no no, no because you joke going, no because you, here's the thing you joke about it in two different ways you joke about it i think sometimes like do you carry shame about this about what about the low body count yeah and and yeah yes yeah yeah i um i think i feel i think i feel like i i don't feel like Oh no, I want that now, but I do mm. feel like I could I could have had more fun if I'd been a cooler person. Is the truth. Right. <laughs> so I feel like That's I would fair. have liked to have I don't think I've ever been someone who would have enjoyed objectifying myself personally, but that's also because I have so much deep like childhood like sexual trauma stuff so I think that was never in the cards for me um you know I'll still wear the like the little skirt or the busty top but like occasionally um but generally I feel quite protective of myself in that way like I don't do sex scenes in fact I was supposed to audition for the most recent season of your show oh, and oh. the character was supposed to be quite sexy and I pulled out of the audition because mm. I I'm so shy about anything sexy that I can't and then you fucking came out and was like yeah I'm not doing sex scenes anymore because <laughs> I'm just gonna protect myself and I was like fucking hell I didn't even know that was a boundary that we could draw that's fantastic but then I was like I should have gone and done the fucking show uh season five Jimmy Lynn's season waiting five. for you season I five yeah. Yeah. you was no but longer was sexy so, it's oh, you not need a someone show asexual anymore. if you need an asexual <laughs> character to murder like you just <laughs> bring me in to be but I can't even watch sex scenes in films like I can't mm. even like not just in the cinema because I'm very worried about what my face is gonna do mm. but um I uh like I don't think I'm gonna start wanking or something but I just you know I just don't know <laughs> no, what in the this right, case it would be fingering. I don't know what the right face exactly <laughs> uh, like, I don't know what the right face would that. be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but even on my own I have to fast forward through sex scenes yeah. because I become so shy mm. about watching other people so it's not it's not a shame there's just a general like um I feel uh, there's an awkwardness around it, is what yeah. I would say. Yeah, sure. You know what was really interesting when Penn did come out and say, and, you know, shared what his boundary was around sex scenes, mm -hmm. Nava and I were really pouring through all of the comments, and there was, like, a very definite split, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of people who were in the similar camp as you, Jamila, and I feel I'm in that, too, where they don't enjoy watching sex scenes. Um, and actually fast forward through it. Some people were like, I didn't watch season three because it was there was too much sex, which I thought was interesting. It was different from what I expected. I mm -hmm. felt like 
I felt that within myself too and didn't feel like many others would probably relate, but I think a lot more people feel that way. Than yeah. We yeah, I was surprised though that there was a backlash. I feel like uh, <laughs> we, we have not yet evolved to a place where we're allowing men to draw their boundaries as yeah. well around objectification and around sex it's scenes. True. Like I, I saw it happen to the hot chef in um, Emily in Paris where mm. he was like, oh, I, d I don't love being this objectified. And everyone was like, fuck you. <laughs> you can't say that when you're just like, the hot <laughs> chef. You have to be number one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was, so in, it was yeah. so insane, and like he's such oh, yeah. a, a deep and like uh, yeah. rounded, yeah. lovely person. Same Lucas Bravo, and like he had every right to say like, "Oh God, people are sending me really sexual DMs," and mm -hmm. and and I think w women had a really uh, unexpected. I was very surprised by the reaction, like the backlash to that, where it's like, yeah. "Well, then we're not going to support this guy at all." And I was like, <laughs> "Fuck!" If you flipped the gender on that, yeah, if yeah. you flipped yeah. the gender it's on true. that, I was like, that would be a huge societal problem. But I think. I don't, I don't know. I think we just haven't... We're still working a lot of shit out yeah. socially. And I think that that's still an untapped thing. But when, when, when you came out with that and there were people who felt very strongly about the yeah. fact that you should be doing sex scenes even if you don't want to for whatever boundary you have around your marriage, I, I, mm. that, was, that was just hilarious to me. Like, it was, it was, a, bit, it was a bit stressful. But, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm with you. I'm definitely with but you on that. I, can, can I just right, say I'm this? Gonna, I'm keeping track of who's, who's with me. Yeah, I'm yeah, he's got a, a, it's a short down. list so You've far. You've got one. But... <laughs> I've, got, I've got a few. <laughs> yeah. But I was going to say, I actually sent Penn this article recently. Quentin Tarantino, and I'd never tracked this, doesn't do sex scenes in his movies. He had one movie where he filmed one. Mm -hmm. And they asked him about it, and he, he said, like, one, he's never felt that it's necessary to tell the story. But two, the one time he did it, everyone was so tense on set that he just doesn't like it. Like, it's so mm -hmm. uncomfortable to film. And I really mm -hmm. liked sort of because people I feel like people in the industry don't like to say that it's a little bit weird. Everyone's like, no, it's, it's just a choreography. It's just a dance. So it's nice to hear some people say like, you know, it's, it's a little more than that. It yeah. makes people nervous. I feel like it makes fuck them that stressed. guy, but totally. Yeah. 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 Fair. Yeah. <laughs> There's other issues with this film. <laughs> <laughs> <True>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, am incapable of holding my tongue now Sorry. I really so am, I'm not on Twitter I anymore I am interested in what your face would look like uh, in a movie theater watching a sex scene because while Navo was asking that question you were like fuming yeah. <laughs> like you yeah. couldn't like, listen to the question because you heard so, Quentin okay, so this is so this. embarrassing that like I've you know I've had to kind of learn how to socially condition myself to seem normal for such a long time mm. and uh, I've actually come up with a, a face to make while watching sex <laughs> scene. <laughs> what is it? What's funny is that as you, as you said that, you started to make a face that made yeah. me think she yeah, hasn't I'm done this as successfully as she I'm, thinks she I'm has. I'm gearing up to the face that I've made. So, like, when I'm in a okay. premiere or something, mm. it's like a friend's film, uh -huh. I can't leave during yeah. the sex scene or something. So, I was like, sometimes I get trapped mm. in a sex scene, or a sex scene comes and surprises me in a film that I didn't think yeah. it was going to happen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, I've, I've come up with this as. <laughs> Uh, and my elbows come slightly up and just like it has a lot of it has a lot like of a movement little, to it. Like, it just it's, it's the facial expression of huh, huh that's happening. I, mean, huh. <laughs> I, I also like that this is in it. Sometimes this is even in a theater. Yeah, no, where this is the likelihood. Well, yeah, it's everywhere. The likely, but the likelihood of someone else looking at you yeah. is low. Mm -hmm. right? But I have occasionally looked at someone else during a movie theater because <laughs> I'm, obs I'm obsessed yeah, with looking okay, at other yeah. people mm -hmm. in movie theaters or at concerts because I feel like it's one of the only times you see someone's true essence is mm -hmm. when they are looking at something else. They're not aware of themselves. I am clearly hyper aware of myself. <laughs> um, but they, uh, they are they, like when when I my boyfriend is a musician and I don't watch him when he's on stage, which is rude. But <laughs> I watch the crowd because mm -hmm. they look at him. He's very very talented and clever and cool. Yeah. Um, well done him. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. he. Uh, and they they look at musicians with this like awe of someone's being able to create something that's like elevating them and and they look like little kids like their yeah. mouths are slightly mm. open it's and true. the glow of the stage is reflecting back on their lights and their eyes are like dazzled and they're not thinking about themselves or their problems and they're not feeling self-conscious and they're not thinking about internet likes or anything they're just all focused on the same one beautiful thing and I, I I'm obsessed with it so I think because I'm such a creepy you know starer I'm worried that that's going to come back on me and I'm mm -hmm. going to make some sort of weird pervy face or something or I'll look horrified <laughs> or uncomfortable so I've settled on <laughs> Huh. huh. That's interesting. <laughs> huh. I love that. Too I well. think if you make the if you make the vocalization, it's less convincing. <laughs> yeah, Just yeah, yeah. Keep the ha, keep the ha internal. Thank you. No, that's yeah. really that's helpful. my as a person who does a lot of voiceless acting. Yeah. That's my one note to you, and <laughs> I know you, you can take it. You're very. I talented. will take that with me forever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm glad.
Um, this is a sharp left turn, but I, I know about your podcast, I Weigh. I've listened. Mm-hmm. I really, it like really resonates just this idea of your your value not being in your measurements. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and I really, I really am like truly like have been positively impacted by the work you do. So I wanted to take a moment to thank you, but thank also you. ask you like, what was the inspiration for really even being so vocal about body neutrality and how that turned into I Weigh? And did you expect sort of the feedback that you've gotten can you sort of walk us through that whole area? Well, no, I mean, like, you know, I was anorexic from the age of about 11 until my 30s, early 30s, um, and, like, so sometimes, like, severely deathly anorexic. I'd, like, mm. take it as far as I could sometimes. Um, so that was a, it was a very debilitating mental illness that has ruined my life and ruined my health, and I'm still not very well because of what I used to do to my body. And so Mm. I think I feel very passionately about warning others and trying Mm. to stop others from making the mistakes that I made. And because I was so obsessed with celebrities uh, and I was so obsessed with Hollywood actors and fashion models and stuff when I was younger because they looked like they were normal and they were happy. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to model my life on them. Um, And I thought that's what normal was. I starved myself and I, I, I was the... Uh, it's not the only reason. Obviously, there was control and all kinds of different reasons yeah. why one like becomes anorexic. And I think a lot of those hit me. But uh, it had a big influence on me, what society was telling me I was supposed to look like and what bad role models we had and how they were telling us how to starve ourselves and encouraging it and glamorizing it and calling it heroin chic. And so, you know, once I got into the industry and I was in the belly of the beast, I was like fucking hell and I saw all the secrets I was able to I was allowed behind the curtain I saw all the lies and the photoshop and the 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 nonsense and the misery of these women that I thought was so happy all this time I was like someone's got to fucking tell people that this is horseshit that we're starving ourselves for a lie we're selling a lie and so very early into my career, I started to speak out about this and speak out about the beauty standards and the body standards and fat phobia. But no one really listened to me um, because it was pre the Me Too era. Post Me Too, we suddenly wanted to hear what especially women had Mm. to say and what celebrities had to say. And that's had mixed results with uh, certain, you know, celebrity advocacy, including myself. I've been a mess sometimes. Um, But... Uh, suddenly, once I was on The Good Place, everyone started listening to me as if not only had I never said this before, whereas I'm on tape saying this shit like mm. in 2013, 2014, but they acted like no one had ever said it before. So suddenly I was hailed as mm. the inventor of the body positive movement, <laughs> which is not what I was. <laughs> I was just <laughs> someone who'd been speaking about this for like a decade and was very concerned that people were going to end up as anorexic as I had been. And so uh, I just kind of got elevated above all these other activists who've been fighting in this space for a long time and then just tried to I've just tried to navigate my way to make the most of the platform I have without stepping on other people and taking away from their work and that's a very fine line to walk because we just don't listen to the marginalized we listen to the privileged talk about the marginalized right so we don't listen to the poor when they talk about being poor we blame them we say they're lazy they don't have enough work ethic but we'll listen to Russell Brand talk about the fact that there's a disparity the wealth gap uh Mm. we won't listen to me when I was fat talking about the fact that there's a fat phobia in this industry um they said I was just lazy and jealous of the thin TV mm. presenters, and then suddenly when I was slim again, everyone's listening to me like I've never said these words before and like I have mm. the right. And so it's a really tricky, fine line to walk of wanting to make sure that the conversation gets had because because uh, you really get, um, not to quote Eminem too often, but you only get one shot uh, <laughs> and you can't miss this chance to blow the opportunity comes once in a lifetime. I like um, but- <laughs> I, I mean, so many people have said you've only got one shot. You chose to quote Eminem. I know. I, it felt right. It felt right in the moment. I mean, the way that Eminem lyrics live in yeah. my brain without mm-hmm. my my wanting them mm-hmm. there, like mm-hmm. constantly. They, it's he t- like he it's, turned it's, me it's, against Moby, and Moby's fine. <laughs> Like That's he's a, a he's yeah, like a, right. a nice he, I mean, vegan man. He made some great songs in the nineties, yeah. but I'm like, uh, what was it? You too old? Let go. Blow me. Nobody listened to techno. And like, yeah, but let's go. Just give me the signal. I'll be there with a whole list full of new insults of bin dope, suspenseful with a pencil ever since punched himself yeah. into a symbol. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That just amazing. comes off. The, I didn't have to think about that for a second. Yeah. Wow. It was crazy. I even wondered as I started, is this going? And I was like, no, it's there. It's still it's there. there. It's he has to take time to remember his kid's name, but Eminem yeah. lyrics. <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I uh, anyway, I don't remember <laughs> how I got. Well, I'm this, sorry. But, I, yeah, I, I so no, so I you know, so I'm just like I've still been walking that line. I am. Um, inexperienced as a public speaker i'm inexperienced as a famous person on at this level and so i have made mistakes but i have also decided not to demonize myself for those mistakes the way that other people especially like other women on the left like white women specifically seem to have like a big problem if i make any mistakes um i've decided to be fuck up representation right we need representation of people especially women especially minorities who have the right who reserve the right to make innocent mistakes and learn from them and come back we cannot yeah. dispose of people the second they fuck up especially women like we cannot continue mm. to hold women up on this like perfection pedestal so and so i have made mistakes i am fallible i am uneducated like i i was so mentally ill that i didn't have time to learn about other people's rights because i was trying to kill myself for like the first like 20 fucking eight years of my life and so i've learned late i'm coming to the, the game late i'm doing my best i'm scrapping in before i'm a perfect doctor of anything mm -hmm. and everyone's just gonna have to fucking deal with that because i'm gonna keep trying to help people in the way that i can and we have to encourage people to learn because when we make mistakes neurologically that is when we do our best learning on like a scientific mm. level That's is true. when you know a mistake you see a mistake and you acknowledge that mistake that's yeah. when your brain goes, ah, okay, don't do that again. If we make people terrified of making mistakes in the first place, and then we make them too scared to even acknowledge them because we we almost pile on harder once they acknowledge mm. their mistake, uh, we're going to stop people from actually learning. And therein where, well, and therein lies, I guess, the contradiction of like, what is the point of activism if we don't actually believe people are capable of change? Mm, yeah. And True. so that's what I think. Mm. For the uninitiated, Jamila, what is the difference between body neutrality and body positivity? So I couldn't do body positivity. A, body positivity is a whole movement that is for people who live in bigger bodies, as I once did, uh, and who uh, people who have um, disabilities, who get medically and societally discriminated against. And so it's about them having to love what society actively hates. Um, for me, body neutrality felt more appropriate, especially as a slimmer person, where it's like I... I can't do body positivity. Aside from the fact that's not a movement for me, I can't look in the mirror and be like, I love my body. I love my thighs. I love my stretch marks or this, that, and the other. I, because I'm then still thinking obsessively about my body and I'm not mm. thinking about shagging or snacks or my job or my dreams yeah. or my mental health. I'm just thinking about this like vehicle that's supposed to carry me around to all the fun I'm supposed to have in my life. And so... I just decided, you know what? I'm just not going to negotiate with it at all. And I'm not going to have a full length mirror in almost anywhere in my house. I live with many roommates, so we have to have one because they're still actively dating and they need to make sure there's not like come on their trousers or something. But, um, <laughs> oh God, sorry. <laughs> Is a mirror um, the only one? <laughs> Just I mean, the great thing about well, trousers, you can just go like this. Look, scan. Just, this is a look I can teach you. It's just, it's just like this. It's like <laughs> that's good. That's good. You, you're teaching me so much. But um, anyway, I I just. I just don't want to think about it at all. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to try and love you, but I'm also not going to hate on you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to let you go. I'm gonna ex I'm gonna try to exist in a space of neutrality of like it is what it is. Mm. I might not, might not like it because my head has been fucked by societal standards that don't make any sense mm -hmm. um, and are so unfair. But rather than try to push my brain too far, just getting to a point of neutrality is already such a win. And now I have so much more time in the day. I've become a more interesting and more educated, like a, a a better friend, a better lover. Like now that I'm just not thinking about it at all. So so love or hate, either way. I feel like I'm wasting my personal thought on on this shit. And I have the privilege of doing so because I'm not in a body that is actively being punished all the time. Body positivity, I, I understand why they need to do that. But for those of us who don't, I find neutrality, regardless of your size, can be very helpful because it just mm. sets you free because it's a, pr it's a capitalist prison yeah. thinking about all the different things that you're supposed to fix on your body that was never broken. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Bye. <laughs> All right. Well, it was nice to have you on. <laughs> um, I'm having a really yeah. nice time. You're all yeah, really yeah, people. We are. No, we are no, so no, 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 me, me too. I mean, here's the, th here's the thing. You talk about a capitalist prison. I mean, can we just take a second to reflect? Like... What you, you just said a lot, and I and I love this. I love silence. And here's one thing that does not sell ads: <laughs> silence. Uh, we'll be right back.
Thanks for sticking around. Uh, <laughs> Jamila. <laughs> <laughs> Babe. I mean, so so what so what's next for you then? I mean, you know, you you've actually you you have um, you have answered questions within questions, and I mean, uh, you just weren't prepared. What what are what are you what are you excited about right now? You, I mean, well, I so guess you, I'm going to so be you, asexual in season five of you. Yeah, that's <laughs> we're all cool. excited you just cast about it. me in front of everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, no, I, I I'm I don't know what I'm going to do next. And that's always been what's exciting about my life is that I have mm. no idea what I'm going to do next. I have no idea what my limitations are mm. um, to mixed results. Uh, <laughs> I don't see limitations for myself. I just kind of feel like, you know, I, I've, I've spoken before about the fact that I have a very interesting relationship with failure and that I love it. I mm. run towards it. Do you really? Uh, I mean, so as you're I experiencing it, I mean, are you it. like, okay, this is failure and this is like, I like it. Yeah, or, yeah, not in like yeah, like uh, it it doesn't you know um, arouse me, but it uh, it definitely stokes a fire in me where I'm like failure is where I have the funniest stories. Failure is where yeah. um, my friends enjoy my day the mm. most. Uh, failure is where I learn the most, and it's it's always been in the periphery of failure that I found something magical about either myself or life where I was like, oh, I, I can't do this, but I'm actually kind of good at that. I'm going to go off and I'm going to go off and do that for a bit. And so mm. I, um, I think there's something really cool about failure. I think there's something very noble about running towards failure when success isn't guaranteed. And I think we are, especially as women, but generally people, we are so encouraged against that. And especially because our lives are all, whether you're famous or not, so much more public than they used yeah. to be. It's you don't true. feel like you have the space to try and fail and be vulnerable in the way that you did when I was growing up. And mm. I really want to promote uh, being willing to embarrass yourself because it's very rare that you die from it. Mm -hmm. Very, very rare. Uh, it is, um, the chances are you'll grow and learn and find something really interesting. I never planned on being a TV presenter. I never planned on being a radio DJ. I never planned on having a podcast or being a writer or being an actress. All of this came because I put myself in a room that I didn't belong in. And I very much so treated imposter syndrome like a wedding, you know, where it's like I've crashed a wedding and before anyone kicks me out, I'm going to, you know, kiss who I can, lol. You're going to get married. married. <laughs> and I'm going to get some cake and then I'm going to fuck off. Yeah. And so that's, I, I, I treat my whole life as like, uh, as a wedding that I've crashed and I, I refuse to negotiate with imposter syndrome. I'm like, you know what? The voices in my head, they're right. Maybe I don't belong here, but fuck it. YOLO. Yeah. You're talking about seeing failure as, um, as an opportunity to learn. Which is very brave. I think it's like that's not it's yeah. not common. So I'm just wondering where you think that unique kind of 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 outlook or courage came from. I think it's not confidence. I think it's just uh, um, what is it? A bankruptcy of fucks to give. You know, <laughs> like I I think it's it's not that I think I deserve or can do anything I just I'm up for the adventure I've been through so much by mm. such a young age and I came out of it alive all the things that they tell you you won't survive or find your way out of I thus far have you know I've scraped my way out and I've been very damaged by a lot of it but I'm still here and I'm still able to see the fun and the joy and the laughter in life and so I feel like well fucking hell I survived all of that including like being publicly shamed which mm. as a woman you're like told to kill yourself if anyone disapproves mm. of you like I I have it's been true. through all of that abuse, all of that trauma, all of this shit, all those heartbreaks, everything that I thought, you know, was going to end my capacity for happiness didn't. So now I'm just like, well, fuck it then. I've been fear-mongered for a lot of my life about a lot of things that actually were quite survivable. And so I'm going to just make the absolute most of everything. I've, you know, I've suffered way too much for someone so young and now I'm on like a determined like adventure for pleasure. I've, you know, I feel like, you know, I don't want to have kids and it's because I feel like I've raised a bunch of people. I've been a mother mm. since I was nine years old. They, they are all okay now. So I feel like they've all fucked off and gone to college and gotten married in my head. And mm. now I'm like, a, I'm like in my Diane Keaton era. You know what I mean? I'm wearing linen. I'm wearing You're linen right now. You're 85 years old. Yeah, I'm 85 years old. I'm wearing linen. I wear linen all the time, guys. Uh, and I feel like that's what you do when your kids grow up. Because uh, yeah. you can't be bothered to steam stuff. Why would yeah. I steam stuff? I've raised a bunch of people. Uh, and now I just want to have fun and adventure. And I want to make uh, a difference where I can. But I don't want to be remembered for it. I'm not interested in legacy. <laughs> I just, I want to, I really want to experience it all because so much, 
so much of it has been taken away from me just because of my gender. I've been told this isn't for you, that's not for you, this isn't for you, that's not for you. And also because of my race. And I, actually, that was all bollocks. And I'm doing it all, and I'm living it all, and sometimes I fuck it up. But I'm trying, and I'm here. And I hope that can be some source of inspiration for someone else who who feels like they're not allowed. Like, I am, I am your reminder that you have permission to to try, get messy, and enjoy yourself. Yeah. So I think I have a I have I really like this. I have a nice segue here. Um, when you said you 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 have a, a bankruptcy of fucks mm -hmm. with which you might give, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. missed an opportunity to quote Eminem. Uh -huh. uh, I just don't give a fuck. I mean, it's yeah. classic, classic. But I just wanted to yes. note that. However, I also think that what you're talking about. I mean, this is the thing about not giving a fuck, which I it's 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 an Obviously, we know the spirit in which it's said when it's a positive thing, meaning... But I think it's akin to a spiritual perspective. You're realizing, I don't have anything to lose, I only have something to gain, which is to say you have a belief in gaining something. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that that extends to what we could call spiritual perspective. I'm just curious, w growing up with the background that you have, did you have... Did you have any kind of spiritual, like, mm. uh, like no. What, what? No, 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 I'm barren. Nothing? I'm barren, can't meditate, <laughs> can't do anything. Yeah, yeah, I can only, like, the only time I can still my mind is when I compulsively clean my kitchen. But mm. I, um, yeah, nothing. There's nothing going on up here. <laughs> There's nothing. Like I. All right, well, I, for the second time today, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm so uh, sorry. No, I don't have a spiritual journey. I do have a very pragmatic uh, way of looking at the world. Um, and I, I see uh, societal norms as very arbitrary and they don't really mm. make a lot of sense. And I think a lot of my work with social justice is not because I've got such a big bleeding heart and I want to help mm. everyone and I feel so much empathy. A lot of the times I, I don't feel very connected to anything, but I don't think it makes sense. Social injustice and inequity, inequality just doesn't make sense. And I want to fix it because it's broken and it's not fair. Um, so I, 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 th I think it's more that I just don't think it's my, my responsibility, especially not just because I'm a woman, that I should be liked or approved of or believed um, or obedient. It doesn't, it's ridiculous that I should have a different set of standards to live by. And so I just don't have, I've never had a personal interest in, in really in, in being li liked or being popular. Mm. And I think that probably comes from the fact that I just wasn't when I was younger. Mm. So maybe that normalized me to the fact that I would be disapproved of in my life or I would be otherized. And I just, uh, I, I'm here for me and maybe that sounds selfish, but I'm here for my own personal experience. I'm not a billboard for other people to project their bullshit onto. And, and I, and I, I'm, only really like I've only really given my per, per, myself permission to be like that since I was about 26 so I'm in like year 11 of this experiment of like what well, if I just stop trying and I just am myself and I show mm. my ugly and see who loves me for me and mm. it turned out some pretty great people uh stuck around and and that feels so much better than all the people who loved me when I was mm -hmm. wearing a mask mm. you know so um that's yeah. what happened Jamila, you've kind of famously called out um, other celebrities, including the Kardashians, for for practices that you think are harmful to youth. And I'm wondering, have you ever bumped into them, and what was that like? I have bumped into I have bumped into them um, at parties before, but we don't really uh, talk, and um, that's probably for the best. <laughs> I really don't like hate them as people mm -hmm. i think that no, they it's are like the symbol uh, i think that they are victims of the system yeah, yeah. and victims of our society but i do think they have a responsibility to not then recycle that pain and trauma yeah. that they've been into and then traumatize and uh, exploit other young people so yeah. i've just i'm i'm all about the logical uh, ow ah oh, it's hit my hands so hard <laughs> um sorry uh, i'm all about You're raising your fist in the air yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um on my crusade on my so i was just climbing up to my soapbox and i injured myself sorry yeah. um no i uh i just don't think it's correct or fair for us to take the harm that was done on us when we were younger and then um, replicate it for profit later mm -hmm. because then we're just carrying on a cycle that we know exactly, oh, yeah. we know literally how harmful it is. I'm the same age as most of them and like, I know what they grew up in and then yeah. I watched them grow up and I was a huge supporter of them Like, and they were getting body shamed to fucking death. Yeah. So of course they are the way they are but you don't then turn around and make money and then encourage more of that and and take that beauty standard that almost like, you know, that, that hurt you so much and then mm -hmm. impose that on other people uh, and then make loads of money from it. I think that's just not ethical and so 
I really like honestly my heart goes out to them and most of my life and and still now I have tremendous empathy for those women um and I can't imagine their existence but also we have to draw a line yeah. at which we excuse people just because they've been through trauma and so that's that's how I feel I, I hold myself to that very same standard you know and I've had plenty of opportunities to exploit beauty standards for money and I have had to turn down, and it's not like, oh, I'm so great. It's just that I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Like that inner 12 year old mm -hmm. in the crutches and the snakeskin pleather trousers is watching me all the time. Yeah. Mm. And I never stop thinking about her. Uh, and she would hate me so much if I go and take that poison and put it back into the world. I have to find a way to purify it. And I'm trying to do that with the truth the best way I know how. Mm. I'm not better than anyone for that. I just. I know what it's like to lose 20 years of your life to anorexia and it, only 30% of people ever fully recover from it, which is such a low percentage mm -hmm. given how many of us are now struggling with body image and it can kill or destroy the life of another 30% and 30% of people would sort of just kind of exist um, within it. And it, it, it's such a life ruiner. It's the number one uh, cause of death of any mental illness. It's not taken seriously enough and it's growing. We are at the highest numbers we've ever, ever seen in it. So it's just such a pointless way to lose your life. And if I can help people avoid that the way that I did it, you know, I, I'm the, like, I fucked up so you don't have to. I'm the, like, I'm the piece of shit that I made earlier, you know, <laughs> so that you don't need to <laughs> make all my mistakes. Yeah. And while you can't download your mistakes into other people's brains, I can at least try to warn people, you know, not to go down into the basement of diet culture. Yeah. In their own I think underwear. what think what you'd be capable of if you could steal your mind for just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Jamila, you said something on a talk show once that really stuck with me. You were talking. Was it anything's a dildo if you're brave enough? <laughs> you know, it wasn't that one. That was my second choice. But <laughs> no, you said I forget who it was, but um, you were talking about Photoshop in the industry mm. and oh, how yeah. you will. I think it was for She-Hulk for the poster. You mm -hmm. asked them to remove the Photoshop that they had done because not just... Oh, no, you're talking about... They they didn't Photoshop my She-Hulk poster. You're talking about the good place where they took my back fat out of the photo and I was like, yes. put my fucking back fat back in. Like Yeah, and, and the reason you gave was because then it makes it harder for you to look at yourself. Like you then see, you think that's what you look like. And then when you look in the mirror, you become unhappy. But because it's not a realistic, mm. it's not you. No, it made me feel disappointed in my back. And I was like, fucking hell, I've already yeah. like, I've already been working on my, you know, my neck, my pussy and my crack. Like I can't also <laughs> think about this. Like this is ridiculous. Yeah. Like I'm already just trying to get through the fucking day alive, get yeah. out of an Uber unraped, you know, yeah. like I can't be worrying about back fat. Like Jesus yeah. Christ, like abortion rights are being taken away. Like don't put this on me. Like you've imposed your standard of what you're disappointed about in my body on me. So I was like, put my back fat back in. It was like, 19 emails back and forth until wow. I managed to get my and it was such a stupid tiny crusade that I went on but it was for my own self so that I could see a no, billboard I could see back fat little girls could see back fat yeah. I made them always keep my stretch marks on my tits because mm. I got tits very young so I've got big stretch marks um yeah. right up them and I never wore makeup on them because I need us to be okay with this shit because yes. the, the person who suffers most when you photoshop yourself is you because mm -hmm. you yeah. compare yourself to an AI image and it's there's so no true. fucking way. So regardless of whatever we say about the responsibility that we have to young people who look at us, which obviously I care about, it fucks your brain. How are you mm -hmm. supposed to comp compete with this like ex Mahina level like perfection? Yeah. That's why everyone's like surgery is soaring and everyone it's, looks yeah. the same now. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. It's just... like everyone's got the same one evil surgeon. I know, it's true. <laughs> As a personal <laughs> aside, I also have stretch marks right <laughs> all the way up my boobs. Yeah, yeah. And I remember one time seeing something on my Instagram Explorer page, like Jamila Jamil posts a picture showing her stretch marks on her boobs, which that is also wild that there's like media outlets that are posting so that. Yeah. But I remember going and like searching and like zooming in and feeling on so... On my tits? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I did. But feeling... This is the one context where that's not weird at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just feeling... And it's empowering. For the Pen first is time. silent right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just exclaimed. I, I am otherwise silent. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that feeling. I remember that moment so viscerally. And I think what you're saying is true. It's not only important for you to be able to see yourself how you actually are so that you don't mm -hmm. develop this warped perception, but it's so, it's so impactful. 
on so many people oh, that you thanks. have no idea. That's true. I, I remember the exact moment where I was like, am I going to do this or not? Which is that um, the makeup artist on um, The Good Place just naturally went without pause or without speaking to me to put a makeup sponge on the top of my breasts uh, to cover up my stretch marks. And I looked in the mirror and I had this, and this doesn't happen to me very often, but I had this crazy flashback to being, to looking in the mirror at 12 years old when I swear I got boobs like overnight. I woke up mm. one day and, and when, smetch, when smetch marks, when stretch marks first appear, they're dark red. Mm -hmm. um, they eventually become like light or whatever, but it looked like I had like track, I didn't even know what the fuck they were. It looked like I had someone had like clawed me up both of my breasts mm -hmm. and I stood there sobbing in the mirror because I didn't understand what happened and I was like, oh my God, I'm ruined. My body is ruined. This is so, mm -hmm. I look like I've been attacked by Wolverine. Like I, uh, and and how much that scarred me and it, it really, really impacted me and I, you know, impacted the way that I dressed for years and I, I, I was transported back in time 30 years to that moment or 20 years to that moment. And I was like, no, don't mm -hmm. cover these up. Please don't cover these up. I want these out for the whole show. Yeah. <laughs> and I was always in low cut tops as mm -hmm. Tani. And I was like, I, I, I actually can't do it for her. This bitch yeah. is following me around everywhere. Mm -hmm. I cannot get rid of this 12 year old. She <laughs> is always in my head. I've got a gun to my head all mm -hmm. the time, reminding mm -hmm. me of everything she went through, which just keeps me, you know, keeps yeah. me on track. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, just thank you. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. On Thanks TikTok, there was that. like a, a filter called AI Glambot that went really <laughs> viral. And I, I, I'm like barely on TikTok. I mostly post videos of my dogs to like Taylor Swift songs. And but like once in a while, I'll make a TikTok. And I like tried the stupid filter. I never try them. And for like four days, I couldn't stand looking at my face on Zoom. And I was, I was just thinking like, up. I'm like a woman in my 30s. Like imagine if I'm like a 12 year old using this. Like, yeah. yeah. So I was like, I'm never going to use them I again think, after I that. think like tin hat, I think plastic surgeons are the ones like investing in these fucking apps because they're <laughs> the ones who make the money. Probably. I think. Yeah, doo -doo 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 yeah because people doo -doo 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 will go in and say, I want to be, I want to look like myself. They'll take a picture of themselves with the filter. And be yeah, because like, the filter is just like, this is what you look like. If your nose is but a I, little bit yeah. trimmer, if your brows are a little bit higher. Yeah. yeah. yeah a lot of my friends are guys and um, they have become, their brains have become conditioned to the right. way that women right. look on social yeah. media and again yeah. it's not just celebrities like photoshop and facetune and everything is you know and diet culture is that like kind of democratized that sort of aesthetic and it's sort of like some of them have had to come off instagram or stop watching porn because their brains are being like morphed where they're meeting people that they really connect with but their brain their like dick brain is being like no this isn't the thing that we've become used to seeing and so yeah. it's getting in it's getting in the way of their romantic like their meaningful romantic lives not to say you can't have a, a wonderful romantic life with someone who looks you know like the way that a victoria's secret model can look uh, there are uh, lots of them are married happily with babies but my point being that that it's not fair for your brain to be so manipulated. Mm. And I don't, and I think we demonize men sometimes for having a standard that just like we're seeing it and we're conforming to going like, yes, that is perfect. That is what I should be. They are seeing so much of that. Yeah. Like it's fucking yeah. all of us up. It's, it's, and, and we're seeing also like men develop like more um, mental health issues around aesthetics is really bad within the, the, the gay community, like the body standards and everyone feeling they had to have muscles. Like I, um, I was trying to help uh, pass a bill just before the pandemic. Then it kind of got a bit um, pushed back. But that was talking about the, the the materials that are in diet products or fitness products for, for that a lot of kids are taking. And so they were putting things like speed or laxatives and in, oh in the gosh. weightless products that mostly girls were using. And they were putting mm. Viagra and heavy metals in a lot of the muscle gain products that young wow. boys are taking, trying to get this like perfect marvel aesthetic but it's the body standard thing is just fucking us all in that these very unique and plentiful ways and we need to be so mindful of it and this has to be like not a gendered war this can't just be women fighting against this because yeah. it's they've run out of real estate on our bodies like back fat elbow mm. fat armpit wrinkles like yeah. we've really like there's there's no they're not not an inch left to pinch anymore yeah. for capitalism so we've moved on to men's bodies and we need to just stop this rot together because it's wasting so much fucking time yeah, and money and life quality and and the funny thing is that some people do it because they they think that more people will want to shag them that's what I did when I was starving myself I was like if I look more like a model more people will want to date me and the truth is I was so tired and my estrogen was so low I didn't fuck anyone for years. 
Mm. Not for years. I was so exhausted. Why. Yeah. <laughs> just no. too tired. Actually, no. 6 p.m. all around, you're like... <laughs> no, yeah, but like in my true. 20s, between like the age of 24 to 27, when I was like on the cover of like Vogue and mm. like the face of Maybelline campaign, this, that and the other, it's like I, the, uh, that, those were what I thought would be I, I, where I looked, according to me, my most fuckable, and I did not have sex with any... I didn't hold anyone's fucking hand during mm -hmm. those three years because I was exhausted that makes sense. I yeah. was so tired. I was so hungry. I was so weak. It was the last thing on my mind. So the hilarity is we do all these things to look in a way that's going to make more people want to date us. And then we don't have the energy to date them. It's we just true. want to go home. Jane Fonda <laughs> recently talked about she had bulimia for a number of years. And I'm raising this because I'd never thought about it until she said it. And now you're saying the same thing or something similar. And she was saying that those years she couldn't hold a relationship because she had a secret life. Like she was so ashamed of it. So she couldn't bring anyone in. But she was starving herself because she thought men wanted her to be quite thin. And mm -hmm. it's sort of like it's so interesting that you you think you're doing it for one reason and then it alienates you from that very thing that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, the, ba the bouncier I've been in my life, the most sex I've had. So I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what the correlation is. I haven't done yeah. the maths, but it seems to to not be like a finite rule. So that's yeah. good. I we have a final question that we ask. I want to ask it, but I also want to give anybody a chance if there's any other questions before that. Or if you you're doing like a mind mm -hmm. movement, is there is there anything you want to plug, Jamila, before we? Yeah. Yes, so I've decided to address the fact that we have made exercise a part of diet culture as a society and people only work out a lot of the time, even if they say it's for their mental health, generally it's like in the hopes of, of weight loss or body goals and mm. that's fine and you do you, but when we look at exercise only as this kind of punishment for eating and only as this thing that's going to ascertain us these kind of long-term goals, you know, we are, we are an instant gratification generation and waiting for abs or waiting for the 100 pound or 20 pound, whatever weight loss takes a really long time and a lot of discipline. And so then people end up bowing out altogether and they feel like gym clothes are made for skinny people, the fucking mm. like bra tops and the tight leggings that are so thin and lemon colored so you can see your clitoris through them like mm -hmm. it's like again if you want to wear them do it but that's quite alienating to a lot of people i don't want to wear that shit when i work out i don't want to look in a mirror when i'm working out i don't want to work out for a long-term body goal because then i'll lose the will and we mm. don't ever talk about the endorphins and the the like vital hormonal balance that comes from it the vi vital mm. glucose balance the sleep the stress reduction the instant benefit you get mm. after doing exercise and it doesn't have to be this strenuous like formative weightlifting with perfect form there's any exercise you can do if we can just bring people back to joyous exercise then we could change people's lives like i think medication is amazing but i have mm. massively lowered my medication when i'm walking every day yeah. and when i'm dancing around my house and when i'm doing really like inane stupid unattractive shit in baggy clothing my life exponentially like increases in joy and peace and stability and well-being so i'm bringing back moving for your mind where we're taking the body out of it mm. and we're just like but like fuck the body let's just do this all for our brain for instant results mm. and so on instagram uh i'm promoting this now we're finding trainers around the world who don't do anything to do with fat shaming when it comes to exercise and we're going to be hosting an event this summer in los angeles then we're going to take it hopefully around around the world and we are going to democratize exercise we mm. are leaving so many people out and it is damaging their lives in ways that are so much more important than the aesthetic mm. and so i feel like having had an eating disorder for so long i know what the triggers are enough that i feel as though i'm ready to take on the responsibility of trying to reframe exercise mm. And if anyone oh wants God, to get involved me. in LA, how could they do that? Is it open? Just follow follow me on uh, either at iWay, which is my um, mental health movement account, or follow me on Instagram, and we're going to be talking about it all throughout May. Okay, and cool. and that's where that. you'll be able to find out more details. Exciting. Thank you. But yeah, for people with disabilities, pregnant people, people in bigger bodies, like what are we doing? What? Why is the word exclusive a good thing? Mm. Uh, leaving people out has become this. It's so it's, it makes us such bastards that we've turned that into like a good word mm -hmm. I, I really 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 passionately feel like it's so stupid to leave so many people out it's also not even good for business it's yeah. ridiculous so to um to leave it for like 10 percent of the population everyone needs to be moving we just have to be moving for the right reasons yeah amen <laughs> all i heard is that you're Sorry, doing this I for money rant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh so let's go back to the 12 year old jamila pointing a gun at, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 30s, She's locked Jamila? and loaded. Yeah. yeah. 
She's, she's with she's the NRA. She's watching your every move. She's uh-huh. watching your every move. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, what would you say to her if you could go back? I mean, I guess she's right there, but let's pretend you had to travel a distance um, at a time. You know, what, what would you say to 12-year-old Jamila? I'd say I'm so sorry that I didn't advocate for you the way I advocated for everyone else my entire life. I'm so sorry that I wasn't your best friend when you needed one. And that was the first person I should have stood up for. That was the first person, not just against other people, but against the voices in my head. Like I'm so, I've really, I really let her down and I left her on her own while I was trying to save everyone else. And Mm. um, it only left me emptier for those around me later on. And so I'm trying to restore that now. But my 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 biggest hope for people who follow my work is that they learn that you you have to, like anything you wouldn't tolerate being said to someone that you love, you must not allow yourself to say those things to you. You have to protect that because it will decimate you later in ways that like there's so much shrapnel to try to collect that it's so not worth it. So as young as you can, start sticking up for yourself and be your own best friend. That was a, mm. a massive mistake of mine. Love that. Mm. Thank Jamila, you. this has been so delightful. Yeah. Really, really Thanks. enjoyed it. Well, Thank I had a you. lovely time. Um, um, I, uh, I feel like 12-year-old me will be like, there were some things you shouldn't have said on that podcast. <laughs> uh, we'll have a word after this. <laughs> You can listen to Jamila's podcast, I Weigh, or Bad Dates, wherever you stream your podcast. You can also follow her mental health advocacy work at I underscore Way, And you can follow Jamila personally at Jamila Jamil. Are you aware of the frame for our show, the framework? I, the time of life. I, I, maybe I spoke I'm too vaguely, I'm vaguely, I'm vaguely aware. Yes, I'm vaguely aware. I have not okay. yet listened to it because I'm terrible. No, no, no. All good. Oh, no. That's that. That that that. But that, that I also wasn't find fishing. that quite exciting. Like it makes it more exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's a thrill. Me. Yeah, there is a frame. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. you know I actually. Is this think a porno? A, in, that, <laughs> in that way, it's a little bit like like your new podcast. There, there is. We're going to send nudes in about in ten which, minutes. Just to- <laughs> great.